Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished participants. We're delighted to have you here in Istanbul to participate and share in the 28th Annual Conference of European Business Ethics Network. Thank you for coming. We know that many of you traveled for long distance to participate to this conference. It reminds us all just how important our work is. Now, Professor Mahmoud Arslan, President of European Business Ethics Network, Turkish chapter, and Head of Organizing Committee of this conference will address you. Good morning, everyone, dear guests. I am honored to open 28th Annual Conference of European Business Ethics Network. We are hosting second time an annual conference as Event Turkey. Some of you can remember that we hosted 2008 annual conference in Antalya in a resort hotel. This year, we are in Istanbul. Istanbul was imperial capital of Byzantine and Ottoman empires, and it is the only city in the world that founded in two continents. Europe and Asia. Now, we are in the European part of Turkey, and it will only take half an hour if you want to cross to the Asian part of Turkey, Anatolia. Dear friends, I believe 28 years of survival is a great success for an international umbrella organization. Now, IBAN is a very well-known organization in applied ethics, not only in Europe, but also in the world. Let me tell you my story about Iban. It was a lovely spring day in 1999, when I was a young PhD candidate at Leeds University, UK. I was about to finish my PhD thesis in work ethics. My supervisor, a young junior lecturer, Simon Robinson, told me that there will be an important business ethics conference in Oxford University and I should present my findings in this conference before my viva. The conference was Iban UK annual conference organized by Professor Jane Collier and Professor Christopher Cotton at that time. It was my first conference paper, and luckily my findings were found very interesting, and I was invited to publish my paper in a business ethics journal, and of course, it was my first publication. After the conference, I was a member of IBAN UK. Next year, I attended IBAN annual conference in Cambridge University. When I returned to Turkey as an assistant professor, of course, young still, I decided to open the Turkish chapter of IBAN. My colleagues supported the idea and we organized the first business ethics conference of Turkey in 2003. Although it was a national conference, many friends from Iban supported us by sending their papers. We had also unforgettable support and encouragement by president of Iban at that time, Professor Heide von Hoivik. She joined the conference in Ankara and after completing the procedures, Eban Executive Committee approved Eban Turkey in uh, 2003. Hacettepe University Center for Business and Professional Ethics took the responsibility to represent Eban Turkey. After having some local activities, we organized Eban Annual Conference in 2008. During this organization, we had also great support by President of Iban at that time, Professor Luc van Leerdekerk and his team. He is not with, that, uh, with us at the moment, but he will be with us tomorrow. We are expecting him. Um, another Iban president, uh, Alejo Sison, he is not with us now. Uh, he also support, uh, supported us by joining our local conferences and meetings in Turkey. When we were offered to organize uh, 2015 annual conference, we found enormous support by President of Iban, Mr. Anthony Gortzis. His guidance helped us very much in the organizing process. I should also mention that he is an Istanbul from his mother's side, and we are delighted to see him in the city of his ancestors, Kalosorizimastin Politesnis, Mr. President. This conference 
couldn't have been conducted without the support of paper presenters and their academic efforts. We thank all of them to participate to this conference. I should also mention great efforts of even secretaries, Anne van Espen, and now Dr. Mario Schiller, he is with us now, and to make things better and more efficient. I am proud to announce that we have great heroes of this story with us today. Simon Robinson, Heide von Hoivik, Anthony Gotzis, and Mario Silage. They all deserve a big thank you. We appreciate very much their support. Thank you indeed. I should also thank my dear friend and Dean of Faculty of Economics, Professor Dr. Ur Ömür Gönüşen for his support of uh, Iban Turkey activities starting from 2003 with his wife and our colleague, Dr. Mina Ömür Gönüşen. Regarding annual conference of this year, I would like to express my gratitude to our main sponsor, TÜRMOP, the Union of Turkish Financial Consultants Chambers and its president, Mr. Nail Shanlı. We would not organize such a big conference without their support. The academic guidance of even executive committee should also be acknowledged, and we appreciate so much their attention. Gratitude and thanks also go to Mr. Nezih Kuleyin, general manager of SEMOR, our organization firm, and his assistant, Fatma Gürer, for undertaking all financial risks of this conference. Last but not least, I would like to thank our assistants Asli Karademir and Semi Turan for their enthusiasm and hard work. They always motivated me to keep going when I had a difficulty. Dear friends, I hope we all will take advantage of this conference by having new insights and ideas. We'll come again and enjoy your staying in Istanbul. Değerli misafirlerimiz, hepinize hoş geldin diyor. Sevgi ve saygılarımı sunuyorum. Thank you very much, Professor Arslan. The host institution, Hacettepe University, is represented by Dean of Faculty of Economics and Administrative Sciences, Professor Ur Ömür Gönülşen. Now we're inviting him to deliver his opening speech. Distinguished colleagues, dear participants and guests, dear members of European ethics family, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you on behalf of Hacettepe University for the IBEN annual conference taking place in Istanbul. As an international network, IBEN organizes annual conferences where both academics and practitioners come together, share their experiences, and learn from each other. This year conference, which is organized by our university, Center for Business and Professional Ethics, is now taking place in Istanbul with the theme of business ethics, peace, and environmental issues. Business ethics, as you know, traditionally focuses on ethical issues happening in business firms. For example, code of conduct, ethics hotlines, whistleblowing, mobbing, sexual harassment, etc. However, today, business ethics is not limited to the narrow ethical issues of business firms but also includes some important and crucial social and political issues. For example, peace and conflict resolution, human rights, values, sustainable development, and many kinds of environmental issues and environmental protection. All of them actually go beyond the business firms. Peace studies and environmental sustainability are increasingly becoming attractive issues among academics and politicians. 
world peace can directly be affected by the lobbying activities or unethical and even corrupt attitudes of some multinational firms, particularly in defense and energy industries. So, while business ethics begins to interact with peace building and conflict resolution dynamics, the theories of peace building raise some questions for ethical theory and for ethical dialogue. Also, environmental ethics forces us to rethink the boundaries of morally acceptable acts in the field of environmental protection. Myself, as a student of public service ethics for at least two decades, and as a member of the board of management of Ibn Tiar, these issues are highly interesting for me as well. So, the conference aims at broadening dialogue in Europe and beyond Europe on the different and enlarged dimensions of business ethics by bringing together many scholars as well as many practitioners from different disciplines from various countries to stimulate regional and global exchange, facilitate mutual understanding, and contribute to policy making in such delicate and problematic areas of ethics. This international conference is actually the third event of Hacettepe University Center for Business and Professional Ethics. This center organized similar events in 2003 in Ankara, it was more national one, but also two annual conference in Antalya and this time in Istanbul under the perfect administration of Professor Mahmoud Arslan. Therefore, I would like particularly to thank to Professor Arslan who provide us with an excellent opportunity to discuss business ethics issues at regional and international levels. I also congratulate him because of his vision, his courage, and also his ability to organize such a big event, academic event, third time in a one decade almost. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere thanks to the organizers of these wonderful events apart from him. Of course, without participation of colleagues and practitioners from various universities and institutions from different countries, this academic event couldn't be realized. I wish you a very fruitful conference. I hope you may find many opportunities for exchanging your ideas and for promoting new academic projects and publications from this conference. I also hope you will enjoy Splendid City, Istanbul. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean. We are honored to have President of Turmop, the Union of Turkish Financial Consultants Chamber, Mr. Nail Shanli with us. Turmop is the main sponsor of this conference. A parallel national ethnic conference will also be started by Turmop tomorrow in Yakut Hall. Now we are inviting Mr. Shanlu for his opening speech. Sayın Bakanım, Avrupa İş Etiği Uluslararası Başkanı Sayın Antoni Gorsis, Hacettepe Üniversitesi İktisadi İdari Bilimler Fakültesi Dekanı Sayın Profesör Doktor Uğur Ömür Gönülşen, 
Avrupa Eşeti Ağı Türkiye Başkanı Sayın Profesör Doktor Mahmut Arslan, kurum ve kuruluşlarımızın değerli temsilcileri, meslek camiamızın değerli oda başkanları, değerli akademisyenler, değerli meslek mensupları, yurt içinden ve yurt dışından gelen değerli konuklar, basınımızın değerli temsilcileri, sizlere öncelikle şahsım ve TÜRMOP kurulları adına saygıyla selamlıyorum. TÜRMOP olarak genelde iş etiği, özelde de meslek etiği olmak üzere mesleğimize ve dolayısıyla iş dünyasına katkı sağlayacağını düşündüğümüz Avrupa İş Etiği Ağı yıllık konferansına katkılarımızı ve düşüncelerimizi sunmak için buradayız. Etik en basit anlamıyla insan ilişkilerinde genel geçerliliğe sahip ve evrensel olarak kabul görmüş değer, değer yargılarını inceler. İş etiği ise iş dünyasındaki davranışlara rehberlik etmek üzere geliştirilen ahlaki ilkeler bütününü kapsamaktadır. Günümüzde şirketler ekonominin en önemli unsurlarından birisi olarak büyük bir güce sahiptirler. Bu bağlamda şirketlerin verimli ve başarılı olması toplumun refah seviyesini arttıracaktır. Gerek sahip oldukları ekonomik güç, Gerek ürettikleri mal ve hizmetlerle toplumu etkiledikleri için şirketlerin birbirlerine, çalışanlarına, müşterilerine, devlete, topluma ve diğer toplumlara karşı yükümlülükleri bulunmaktadır. Ayrıca şirketlerin uzun vadede başarılı olabilmeleri için güvenilir olmalarına ve bu çerçevede etik davranışlarda bulunmalarına bağlıdır. Etik olmayan eylemler rekabetçi ekonominin gelişmesini engelleyecek kayıt dışı yapılara fırsat verecek ve piyasa sistemini kötü yönde etkileyerek kaynakların etkin kullanılmamasına neden olacaktır. Bizim muhasebe mesleğinin en büyük sermayesini toplumsal güven oluşturmaktadır. Bu sermayemizin gelişip güçlenmesini sağlayan unsurlarımız ise mesleki ilkelerimiz, disiplin kurallarımız, etik ilkelerimiz ve bunların uygulamalarıdır. Üyesi olduğumuz Uluslararası Muhasebeciler Federasyonu İFAK'ın etik ilkeleriyle uyumlu bir düzenleme olan serbest muhasebeci mali müşavirler ve yeminli mali müşavirlerin mesleki faaliyetlerinde uyacakları etik ilkeler hakkındaki yönetmenlik 2007 tarihinde yayınlanarak yürürlüğe girmiştir. Etik yönetmenliği ile muhasebe meslek mensuplarının mesleki ilişkilerinde uymaları gereken azgari etik ilkeler belirlenmiştir. Ayrıca TÜRMO bünyesinde bir etik komitesi oluşturulması öngörülmüş ve TÜRMOP Yönetim Kurulu bu yetkisini kullanarak etik komitesini oluşturmuştur. TÜRMOP'un etik eğitim stratejisi çerçevesinde muhasebe meslek mensuplarının etik eğitimi ve etik sözleşme yapılması hakkındaki tebliğ 2014 tarihinde resmi gazetede yayınlanarak o da yürürlüğe girmiştir. Bu tebliğ yıllardır benimsediğimiz ve uyguladığımız etik konusunun öğretilebilir ve öğrenilebilir olduğu yaklaşımını yasal bir düzenleme ile meslek mensuplarımızın istifadesine sunmaktadır. Tebliğin temel amacı etik öğrenme yönündeki istikliliği arttırmak, etik eğitimi ve etik davranışları geliştirmek ve meslek mensupları ile bağlı oldukları meslek odası arasında yapılacak etik sözleşmesinin ve öncesinde de meslek mensubunun tabi olacağı etik eğitiminin usul ve esaslarını belirlemektedir. Etik eğitimi sonrası meslek mensuplarımız eğitim, etik eğitimi tamamlama belgesi almaktadırlar. Bu doğrultuda meslek mensubu, meslek mensupları için etik alanında uluslararası ve ulusal düzeydeki gelişmeleri ve çalışmaları değerlendiren TÜRMOP, etik alanında güncel ve özgün bir çalışma olarak TÜRMOP etik eğitim projesini geliştirmiştir. Bu proje kapsamında muhasebe meslek mensuplarının uzaktan eğitimleri tamamlanmış ve şu anda yüz yüze eğitim yöntemleriyle teorik ve uygulamalı eğitik eğitimlerinin ilk grubu tüm Türkiye'de tamamlanmış ve bu eğitimleri tamamlayan meslektaşlarımıza da muhasebe meslek etiği taahhütnamesi verilmiştir. Bu eğitimimizde TÜRMOP olarak etik konusunda önemli bir adım daha atıyor ve muhasebe etiği alanında çağdaş uygulamaları meslek mensuplarımıza kazandırmış oluyoruz. Değerli katılımcılar, TÜRMOP etik konusunu çok önemsemiş ve mesleki açıdan etiği 
bir yaşam biçimi olarak benimsemiştir. 2009 yılından başlamak üzere her yıl ulusal düzeyde muhasebe mesleği etiği kongreleri yapılmıştır. Bu kongrelerde muhasebe meslek etiğine duyulan gereksinim, yaşamda ve meslekte etik, algılar ve gerçekler, muhasebe etiğinde güncel yaklaşımlar, TÜRMOP muhasebe etiğine, etiğindeki stratejik yol haritası, muhasebe etiğinde temel ilkeler, ana temaları işlenmiş ve değerlendirilmiştir. Ulusal düzeydeki meslek etiği kongrelerin altıncısı, 27 Haziran 2015 tarihinde, yani yarın bu konferans merkezinde işletme stratejisinin bir unsuru olarak etik, planlamadan uygulamaya ana teması ile gerçekleştirilecektir. Ayrıca Türkiye Odalar ve Borsalar Birliği ile birlikte Eylül 2012 tarihlerinde birinci Uluslararası İş Etiği Kongresi geniş bir katılımla Ankara'da gerçekleştirilmiştir. Kongrede ana tema olan iş etiğine stratejik yaklaşım etik liderliğin rolü konusu tartışılmıştır. Kongrede mesleğimiz ve muhasebe camiamızın etik ilkelere bakışı geniş kitlelere ve özellikle müşterilerimize iş alemine anlatılmış olmuştur. Bugün gerçekleştirilmekte olan Avrupa İş Etiği Ağı 28. yıllık konferansını ve yarın gerçekleştirilecek olan 6. Türkiye Muhasebe Etik Kongresi'ni izlemek üzere aramızda çok sayıda meslek mensubu bulunmaktadır. Kendilerine özellikle hoş geldiniz diyor, iş etiğine gösterdikleri bu ilgi için de teşekkür ediyorum. Değerli katılımcılar, bir diğer çalışmamız da Uluslararası Muhasebeler Federasyonu İFAK bünyesinde Uluslararası Etik Standartları Kurulu tarafından yayınlanan Muhasebe Meslek Mensupları için Etik Kurallar El Kitabı'nın 2015 yılı son baskısı birliğimizce Türkçe'ye birebir çevrilmiş ve bu kongre çantalarında sizlere dağıtılmıştır. Hem meslek mensuplarımız açısından çok değerli olan bu kitabın iş alemi çalışmalarında da yararlı olacağı kanaatindeyiz. Küresel ekonomik yapı içerisinde yer almış uluslararası organizasyonlardan kaynaklanan herhangi bir sorun tüm dünyayı etkileyerek ekonomik krizlere neden olabiliyor. Son dönemlerde yaşanan ekonomik krizlerin temelinde çoğunlukla etik temele dayalı sorunlar vardır. Bu nedenlerdir ki etik iş etiği, kurumsallaşma, iyi yönetişim, sosyal sorumluluk, hesap verebilirlik, Saydamlık, etik kod, yolsuzluk gibi birçok kavram gündemimize yerleşmiştir. Yolsuzlukla mücadele de denetim konusu olmazsa olmazdır. Denetimsiz bir alanın başı boştur. Her türlü sistemale ve yolsuzluğa açıktır. Bunun içindir ki mikro işletmeler hariç sermaye şirketlerinin tamamının bağımsız denetime tabi olması gerektiğini düşünüyoruz. Değerli katılımcılar, Konuşmamda muhasebe ilke ve kavramlarından bahsetmek ve bu ilke ve kavramlar ile iş etiği arasında da olan bağları kurmak istiyorum izninizle. Muhasebe uygulaması genel kabul görmüş muhasebe ilkelerine ve bu ilkelerin dayandığı temel muhasebe kavramlarına göre yürütülmektedir. Bu ilkeler sabit ve değişmez niteliklere sahip değildir. Muhasebe aslında dinamik ve sürekli değişerek gelişen bir disiplindir. 1932 yılında New York'ta kullanılmaya başlayan genel kabul görmüş muhasebe ilkeleri ve temel muhasebe kavramları uluslararası muhasebe standartları yoluyla günümüze kadar sürekli olarak değişmiş ve gelişmiştir. Bu ilke ve kavramlardan iki tanesinin iş etiği ile yakından ilgili olduğunu düşünüyorum. Bu kavramlar sosyal sorumluluk kavramı ve işletmenin sürekliliği kavramlarıdır. Sosyal sorumluluk kavramı Muhasebe meslek mensubunun işini yaparken tarafsız ve adil olmasını, bilgi üretiminde toplum çıkarlarının ön planda tutulmasını ve yapılacak açıklamaların sosyal sorumluluk bilinci ile kamuoyu aydınlatma ilkesine uygun olarak yapılmasını öngörmektedir. İşletmenin sürekliliği kavramı ise işletmelerin faaliyetlerine sonsuz ve sınırsız bir şekilde devam edeceği görüşünü esas almaktadır. Gerek uluslararası alanda, Gerekse ulusal alanda faaliyet gösteren işletmelerin etik temele dayanan sorunları 
önce işletme sürekliliğini etkilemekte ve faaliyet büyüklüklerine göre sonuçları ekonomik krizlere varan olumsuz sonuçlar olarak da ortaya çıkabilmektedir. Yakın zamanda yaşadığımız WorldCom, Enron, Parmalat vakaları gibi örnekler bunların canlı örnekleridir. Bu bağlamda iş etiğiyle ilgili tartışmalarda, araştırmalarda, eğitimlerde, etik davranışın geliştirilmesine yönetik çalışmalarda, sosyal sorumluluk ve işletmelerin sürekliliğinin sağlanması unsurlarının temel olarak ele alınması gerektiğine inanıyorum. Değerli katılımcılar, bildiğiniz gibi ülkemiz ile Avrupa Birliği arasında katılım ve müzakere süreci devam ediyor. Bu süreçte önemsenen unsurlardan birisi de sivil, tip, sivil toplum diyaloğudur. Gerek ulusal, gerekse uluslararası platformda ülkemizde her sivil toplum unsurunun bu diyaloğu görüştürmek üzere etkin çalışmalar yaptığını biliyoruz. Bugün burada gerçekleştirdiğimiz bu konferansta Avrupa İş Etiği Ağı'nın Türkiye Serbest Muhasebeci Mali Müşavirler ve Yeminli Mali Müşavir Odaları Birliği, TÜRMOB'un, Avrupa İş Etiği Ağı Türkiye Temsilciliği'nin, Avrupa İş Etiği Ağı Türkiye Temsilciliği'ni 2005 yılından bu yana yürütmekte olan Hacettepe Üniversitesi İşletmecilik Meslek Etiği Uygulama ve Araştırma Merkezi'nin değerli konuklar huzurunda bir araya gelmeleri sivil toplum diyaloğunun güzel örneklerinden birisini oluşturmuştur. Bu vesileyle TÜRMOP olarak burada olmaktan duyduğumuz mutluluğu ifade etmek ve bu konferansın gerçekleştirilmesinde katkıları nedeniyle EBEN Uluslararası Başkanı Sayın Antoni Gortsiz'e, EBEN Türkiye Başkanı Profesör Doktor Mahmut Arslan'a, Hacettepe Üniversitesi İktisadi İdari Bilimler Fakültesi Dekanı Sayın Uğur Ömür Gönül'e teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Artık organizasyonlarda eğitim faaliyetlerinin önemli bir kısmı etik alanında yürütülüyor. Organizasyonlar yazılı etik kodlarını ve etik değerlerini oluşturuyor. Etik tutum verilerinin için geliştirilmesi için çalışmalar yapıyor. Ülkemizde 2011 yılında yayınlanan Türk Ticaret Kanunu'nda kurumsallaşma, iyi yönetişim, hesap verebilirlik, saydamlık kavramları çerçevesinde şekillendirildi. Türk Ticaret Kanunu'nun organizasyonlarda iş edin gelişmesine büyük katkı sağlayacağını düşünüyoruz. Ekonomik faaliyetlerin bir bütün olarak kayıtlanması, raporlanması ve denetlenmesi görevini uluslararası standartlar uygun olarak yerine getirmekte olan muhasebe meslek mensuplarının birliği olan TÜRMOP, muhasebe meslek eğitiminin gelişmesini sağlamak üzere önemli çalışmalar yapmaktadır. Etik eğitimle ilgili olmak üzere değerli akademisyenlerin huzurunda bir konuyu ifade etmek isterim. O da üniversiteler ile mesleki teknik okullarda etik derslerinin daha nitelikli bir şekilde yer almasıdır. Muhasebe öğretisinde devlet, işletme sahip veya ortakları, yöneticiler, çalışanlar, sendikalar, kredi kuruluşları, alıcı ve satıcılar muhasebenin tarafları olarak gösterilmektedir. Muhasebe meslek mensupları muhasebenin taraflarının tam ortasında yer almakta, sosyal sorumluluk bilinciyle kamusal bir görevi yerine getirmektedirler. TÜRMOP olarak hedefimiz 97 bin meslek mensubumuz ile etik eğitimler yapmak, etik eğitimde sürekliliği sağlayabilmek ve dolayısıyla işletmelerde iş etiği uygulamalarında muhasebe meslek mensuplarının etkin rol üstlenebilmelerini sağlamaktır. İş hayatımızda, iş yaşamımızda ve yaşamınızın her aşamasında beyaz alan ile simgelenen etik davranışı ortaya koymanızı, Siyah alan ile simgelenen etik dışı davranışlarla karşılaşmamanızı, gri alan ile simgelenen etik iklimlerin sözümü için meslek örgütünüz ile etik kodlarınızdan destek almanızı öneriyorum. Etik iklimlerin çözümü noktasında destek sağlayacak olan meslek örgütlerinin etik davranış için gerekli ortamı tesis etmek, etik farkındalık yaratma ve etik kültür oluşumu da ortak görevleri bulunmaktadır. Bu görevlerin yerine getirilmesi noktasında TÜRMOP olarak yeni bir çalışma başlatmak istiyoruz. İş etiği alanında yapılacak akademik, akademik çalışmalara destek olmak amacıyla bu çalışmaların geliştirilmesini sağlamak için EBEN yönetimi de uygun gördüğü takdirde Avrupa İş Etiği Ağırlık Konferansı'nda sonuçları açıklanmak 
ve ödülleri verilmek üzere muhasebe ettiği konulu makale yarışması düzenlemek arzusundayız. Yarışma için EBEN ve TÜRMOP yönetimlerinden sağlanacak katılım ile değerlendirme kurulu oluşturulmasını ve yapılacak değerlendirmede birinci olacak eser sahibine 2500 avro, ikinci olacak eser sahibine 1500 avro ve üçüncü olacak eser sahibine 1000 avro ödül verilmesini öngörüyoruz. Muhasebe etiği konulu makale yarışması önerimizin hassasiyetle değerlendirileceğine inanıyor. Ulusal sınav nitelikteki bu konferansın gerçekleştirilmesine olanak sağlayan EBEN Uluslararası ve Türkiye Başkanlarına Hacettepe Üniversitesi İşletmecilik Etiği Uygulama ve Araştırma Merkezi Müdürüne konferanssız siz değerli katılımcılarına şükranlarımı sunuyor. Konferansın başarılı geçmesini diliyorum. Hepinize saygılar sunuyorum. Thank you very much, Mr. Shanlu. Very honored to announce that President of European Business Ethics Network, Mr. Anton Gatsas, is with us. I'm very inviting him for the final opening speech. A very good morning to all of you. Dear President Aslan of the Turkish uh, Aben, dear Professor, dear ex-president of Aben Heidi uh, Hoyvik, dear President of uh, Tuba, thank you very much for your kindness to give us first of all, the opportunity of these awards. Dear professors, members of the EXCOM, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here in this beautiful historic city with you to open this year's open, uh, the European Business Ethics Annual Conference. I'm very happy to be part of this gathering. Thank you very much for this invitation. Actually, um, my friend Mahmoud says that um, the father of my mother, who was born here, who was a very big merchant, he was um, used to say to me uh, when I was a, a small child that um, a trader, he knew that the honest and ethical part of doing business was also a good business. Actually, he using a, a, a words from Turkish language, I will try to, to say it to you. Dogru uh, yoldan sazma. I hope that I pronounce correctly, which uh, freely translated means do not deviate from the correct path. So you have to, to go to the right path. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the current global economic crisis is costing the world of trillions of euros, a protected recession, millions of lost jobs, a huge loss of confidence in financial markets, and a reversal in our effort to curve global poverty. It is the result of the combination of several failures. A failure of business ethics is one of them, one that lies at the epicenter of this financial economic world earthquake. In the coming years, the rules of the global finance and economic system will be rewritten again. The incentives to proper behavior have to be included in those new rules. The crisis will give us the opportunity to build the foundation of a new business culture, more ethical and responsible and more sustainable, I hope. Peace studies and environmental sustainability are increasingly becoming attractive issues to the young generation and to everybody. Peace can be regarded as world peace between states or in the workplace. Peace in the workplace is more micro issue, but it's not less important. 
Sustainability has become a common topic of debate within business and, and IDA or com uh, community in the past years. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. Sustainability is a proactive change where business understands and measures the environmental impact, indirect and direct, at all stages of the value change, and then, importantly, seek uh, holistically to reduce the negative consequences of their activities. So, success comes from companies who believe in business ethics. They have vision, they have mission, they have values, very important, not only for companies, but also for the state. And commitment to excellence, pension, and drive to the leadership. The objectives of the network, of the BAN, is to promote the principles of corporate ethics, of corporate governance, of social responsibility in, ac in academic community, public and private sector, non profiteering organization, and civil society. A BAN aspires to, pay, to play a significant role by providing support to academia, organization, why not EU, professionals, in order to adopt a new management approach with the supply of business ethics principles, research tools, and training, and best practices propagation. Our mission is to promote ethics and excellence in the business, to increase awareness about ethical challenges in the global marketplace, and to enable dialogue on the role of business in the society. Ladies and gentlemen, before the end of my small speech, I want to address the following. There are two Greek words relevant today. The Greek word ethos is related to our word ethics or ethical. But more accurate modern translation might be image. Aristotle says that if we believe that a speaker has a good sense, good moral character, and good will, we are inclined to believe that what that speaker says. So it's very important. So we need to go beyond conventional wisdom. We have to start thinking out of the box. We have to move beyond the con con uh, codification of the existing tools, bringing to them together the countries, enhancing the growth of cultural ties between the countries and try to share best practices in doing business in today's globalizing environment is, pre is a prerequisite. A BEN, by definition, is a very strong brand name. We absolutely have to make the most out of it. We do believe in ourselves. We do believe in our potential. We can exceed our own expectation. We have the tools. We have you, actually, and we cannot afford to fail. It, it is high time that the Ben should act together in harmony and goodwill using tools in a careful, calibrated way. And as Esopos used to say, is united, we stand. Divided, we fall. So we have the pleasure today to have together academics, practitioners, uh, students from Europe, from Turkey, and probably from other countries. And I wish uh, with, uh, with my heart a very fruitful gathering these three days and successful conference. Thank you very much that you are here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gatsis, dear guests and participants. In this section of our opening session, we have the opportunity to introduce you to keynote speakers, Professor Heidi von Howick from Norway and Professor Simon Robinson from the UK. Let me introduce you our first keynote speaker, Professor Howick. 
Dr. Heidewan Wilson Howick, Professor of Business Ethics and Leadership, was until August 1993 elected Executive Vice President and Dean of Faculty of the Norwegian School of Management. She is a Fellow of Harvard Executive Program of the Institute Education Management and a Fellow of Harvard Program of International Negotiations. Her research interests are managing values in organizations, strategy and business ethics, integrating ethics into organizational processes, CSR and the development of ethical competency. In 1994 and 95, she launched the Center of Ethics and Leadership at the Norwegian School of Management and developed a curriculum in business ethics, mainly for the graduate schools and executive management programs. From 1999 until October 2005, she was president of the European Business Ethics Network, an international organization she has been actively involved in since 1989. In 1994, she organized the ABEM annual conference in Oslo, and in 1999 and in 2003, she hosted the EBEM research conference at her institution. She is on the additional board of the Journal for Business Ethics and Journal Ethics European Review, the Journal for Business Ethics Education, and serves as a reviewer for Journal of Business Ethics. We are inviting Professor Horvick to deliver her speech. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of uh, Eben, and also thank you very much for the kind words uh, from the president of Eben too, and of course from the president of Eben Turkey. Um, as you will see, I have chosen a topic uh, which is close to the theme of this conference, namely ethics and leadership as drivers for sustainability. And as a illustration, I have chosen a picture that we have taken of two of our grandchildren in Norway where I live, overlooking a fjord where we have a mountain house. As you can see, the sky looks rather gray and threatening, and the valleys are rather deep. It's a fjord there, it's wonderful for skiing wonderful for hiking, and I think it is an illustration, as far as I'm concerned, ab about what sustainability is all about. We've just heard the uh, in, uh, definition by Mr. Gortzis, but I think the key word is that we have to do whatever we can in order to guarantee a future for the coming generations. And of course, being a, a grandmother of several grandchildren, of course, this has become even dearer to me than ever before. So maybe some things do happen through one's life that really make another impact on our understanding. Now, uh, we could say, uh, like also Mr. Gortz, he said, uh, starting a little bit with a negative note, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair, we had everything before us, we had nothing. With these well-known words, Charles Dickens, in 1859, started the first chapter of his famous novel, Tales of Two Cities, taking place in 1775. In many ways, we can say the same of today. There is affluence, there is poverty, there is suffering, there is wealth, there is rapid depredation of our natural environment, However, there is plenty of technical wisdom, ample possibilities to put knowledge to use, but there is foolish behavior in all sectors of life. There is less trust in business, less trust in governments and churches and researchers in all areas, 
not only in business ethics, are given less financial support. Apparently, we haven't learned very much. But at the same time, I think we are also on the, on the, on the verge of uh, seeing major attempts to redefine business, to redefine capitalism, to redefine the, our future. In this talk, I want to address uh, two major challenges. One deals with the way I believe ethics and leadership can function as drivers for sustainability. And the other challenge I see deals with what, what and how also business schools can com contribute more and maybe better, but also differently when preparing students for, uh, to, to become tomorrow's decision makers. We have learned a lot in the past uh, years, uh, thanks also to the many events we've had in uh, the EBEN network. And I was part of the uh, very first conference in 1998, uh, 1989, sorry, that's long ago. And uh, I've seen a major change and uh, many attempts to bring about the teaching of business ethics at business schools in a way that is suitable. Now, the key words I've chosen for my reflection process here, which I want to share with you, are innovation, attention, imagination, and intuition. And as you can see from my little illustration here, the core is ethics. These concepts are discussed in uh, many different fields uh, of inquiry, such as psychology, social science, humanities, and even your biology. However, I don't know whether it's true, but as far as I'm concerned, less attention has been given to the normative core. And with a normative core, meaning ethics, I want to address the ethical values which are at stake. Innovation is associated with renewal, but also with creating something different, something new, something not seen before, something unique. For example, Facebook, Twitter, are very recent examples. But innovation requires seeing the world as a whole, addressing a need, but not just looking at small solutions, but also understanding the impact these solutions have on others, including the environment. And in many ways, this is the moral in, uh, core or the moral uh, imperative of innovation. Now, many people forget that people can innovate and come up with some wonderful solutions, but sometimes they do not realize the impact this will have. Business will also have to give an answer to these questions and we'll have to document that in the future as well. Well-known examples from earlier times are, as we know, the Body Shop and Ben and & Jerry, and mother, many more uh, companies have followed suit. But on the other hand, if I look at a business school, because that is my other task, innovation has to deal with redesigning the curriculum. And I know some business schools around the world are working on that, but of course it's very, very difficult because how do they manage to include aspects like ethics, leadership and sustainability? It is foolish to believe that one course can do this. Ethics has to be taught vertically and horizontally. With that I mean students need to be taught initially how doing the right thing is both a character issue of the integrity and a moral necessity for sustainable success. But it's also very, very important to embed ethics issues or ethical dilemmas in the discussion in all core subjects. Finally, a capstone course of a program can raise the concrete issues again, taken from reality in order to teach about decision-making and how this is having an effect on all stakeholders. Also, students should understand how ethics is an integral part of their own lives, as a business person, as a citizen, and as a moral person. So let me say a few words about teaching business ethics. 
my experience from 30 years of teaching have convinced me that the best route to take is to integrate discussions of ethical dilemmas in all disciplines. And it's very, very difficult to bring this about. And because there is not a single subject at a business school that doesn't run into ethical dilemmas. Now, the greatest challenge, however, is, is helping the faculty to become comfortable discussing ethical decision-making. We ran special seminars for the faculty, and I know also the Bentley Center in the, U in the US has done the same. But it is also uh, important to use real cases, preferably some, some cases from your own country. Examples from the US are great if they deal with global issues, but the closer you hit home, the better it is. And also we have to keep in mind when it comes to the legal environment, the legal environment plays an enormous role in, with regard to ethics and there are differences between the US legal system and the European legal system. And this is often overlooked. Now the, the drive for bringing about more compliance officers is an example coming from the US of bringing more of the legal, legal setting into the environment than it's actually good for. So it would be much better to have a better understanding of ethics in the legal profession because I think they are lacking a certain understanding of the difference between compliancy and ethics. That's my personal opinion. So the goal when teaching business ethics in the business school is to teach the students to think differently. Now, making students think differently from what they are learning in other courses, it's quite a challenge in itself because you almost have to rewind their programs in their minds because they're so tuned into looking for quick fixes, quick solutions, easy answers, preferably something that can be calculated. So therefore, this, the hardest thing to do is to bring about this thinking differently among the students when you start out because they are still very much involved or molded or modeled by the econ economic man uh, paradigm, where of course everything like efficiency and profit maximization are still targeted. But doing all that involves cost. For the business, there can be costs involved. For the teacher of business ethics, it's a personal cost. You are always the one who is different from everybody else. So accept that fact. You might as well do it right now. And it's always something where people will have to understand you have to make a personal choice and students are not well trained in understanding the impact of personal choices. Now the second form of innovation at a business school, I believe, is moving also up to date research out of the archival, what I call archival tight control system of journals into online journals. Now I know I'm saying something here that people are rejecting, at least my, my colleagues at my business schools think that is wrong, but many online journals are now also peer reviewed and I think the label should be not any longer do not distribute, the sign should read click to share. There is so much good work being done, but it takes from one to two to three years to bring it into the renowned journals. An online version, thanks God, some journals have already started with that, really makes it possible to read the articles long before they are available in print. So I think it's very important to understand we do not have time to waste, we do not have time to lose. If we have something important to say or share, do it as soon as you can. I know criticism will come uh, when I say that, but uh, I uh, dare to say it out loud because I think someone has to do it. And of course, some people say, well, you do online journal articles, do not have the quality insurance, but I think that's uh, a minor issue because quality is also in the eyes of the beholder. So let's have both to begin with and I see, uh, let's find out how it works. 
and business schools should be the first to motivate the same change. The hardest challenge, however, is to involve leadership of a business school. One has to convince the deans, who are always interested in developing a relevant curriculum to attract business students. You have to convince the deans that business ethics is a core subject of all disciplines. So the business schools really have to do some rethinking themselves of how they do business in a more global context, and it is wise to start with the process right now. Now, the second principle that I wanted to address is intuition. I've been always fascinated by the term intuition, because intuition is linked to feelings, empathy, social and moral intelligence, which combined with acquired knowledge can yield a very different perspective. An example here is social entrepreneurship. There are many models of social entrepreneurship. Some are driven by ethical values and motivation, and others, again, are examples of giving the purpose of the company a better sounding label than wealth or profit driven. One should be aware of these differences. Other examples are micro lending, uh, micro loan or micro lending schemes, the cheap use of mobile phones in developing countries in order to further small business endeavors. Telenor, the Norwegian telephone company, did that in Bangladesh. Yet also here, there are underlying financial business models that need to be reviewed because with regard to ethical values, not all the micro lending schemes are done with, uh, with uh, uh, understanding the ethical values involved. Sometimes scaling up the initiatives, they can lead to unforeseen negative side effects. For example, women who for some reason cannot pay back the loan are becoming victimized in their communities. We, people don't talk about that. It's just not all women who have taken a loan um, from a micro lending scheme can pay back their loans and they really become victimized and ostracized in, and, and mobbed in their own societies. Also, the financial sector has entered the scene with social impact investment and it's going to be interesting to observe what they can bring about and it ought to be researched in greater depth. My third key principle of attention here is imagination. Imagination is creating an image, a picture of something new. Moral image, imagination can be part of it. For example, in managerial decision making, moral imag imagination entails perceiving norms, social roles and relationships entwined in any situation. Developing moral imagination involves heightened awareness of conceptual moral dilemmas and their mental models. It's also about the ability to envision and evaluate new models that create new possibilities. It requires the capabilities to reframe the dilemma and create new solutions in ways that are novel, economically viable, and morally justifiable. A colleague of ours, Patricia Wehrhain has researched moral imagination and I recommend the, her articles to you. An example of for this uh, venture is, for, for example, venture philanthropy, which is something new. In contrast to philanthropy, a venture philanthropist invests also his or her competence. It's not just a question of investing money, but also strategic know-how. Other attempts are reframing our economic system, our accounting practices, not least our reporting systems. In the latter case, integrating reporting has made a significant process. Other promising avenues are men and women who are rethinking our present models of capitalism. Labor capitalism, government capitalism, investor capitalism, managerial capitalism, these are all partial and incomplete. Even stakeholder capitalism is just not finished yet. Business ethics has to be a part of it, for example, but not as a critic of business, but as a central part of the evaluation of how value 
is created by trade for sustainability over time. Imagination has no limits, that's the beauty of it. We're nourished by motivation and commitment. And human beings have been capable of doing so and we should encourage that. Now my final point deals with attention. Attention is linked to understanding the nature and interrelationship of different elements. For example, CSR represents worldwide attempts to improve the relationship between business and society by seeking to understand how the two are interlinked and interdependent. When attention is paid to what responsibility implies, companies can manage these difficult relationships in a much more sustainable manner. And during the last 15 years, more and more companies have understood the unique value of sustainable stakeholder relationships. Companies like Nova Nordisk, Hennes Mauritz, IKEA, Norskaido, and Stadtoil. And it's interesting to see just recently, IKEA was awarded an uh, environmental reward. And I have one example which was really astonishing. All the parking places in front of IKEA in Spain uh, are uh, covered, have some roofs, so that you can can keep your car away from the hot sun, but the roof of all the car, car parks are, consist actually of solar panels. So the solar panels who shade the cars parked are driving the energy in the building, also for, of course, air conditioning and whatever the needs are, including electricity, and the overflow is being sold. So it's interesting to see that innovation and imagination and of course attention to what is possible in different parts of the world can make a difference. So value can be created and sustained by paying attention. By paying attention to how just satisfaction, joint satisfaction with stakeholders can be achieved. And also do this partially through voluntary agreements. Business is not about markets. Business is about people working within a system we call markets. They share a contractual, mutual and relational interest in sustaining a well-functioning system. All the above contain, in essence, core normative elements. All require seeing how the others, individually, organizations, societies and the environment are being impacted by human behavior and in particular business actions. Corporate responsibility, I would claim, is dynamic. It's re it requires attention. It requires moral creativity if it wants to be more than just PR. The multiple challenges which businesses face in the global environment have made it absolutely mandatory to further develop our current thinking and, re and reasoning uh, and also reassess previous assumptions about the normative core of doing responsible business. Time has come to foster a more normative, creative approach that is dynamic, continuous, progressive, and innovative. Creative value management depends on paying attention to all values that are at stake. Bill Gates has actually been quite... Uh, um, uh, let's say, courageous by talking about creative capitalism at the Davos World Economic Forum. And maybe you have a chance to hear what he had to say when you look it up on YouTube. Now, at this juncture, allow me to give you a brief summary of what uh, my own research of the history of business and economics in Scandinavia has yielded. Very recent research about the historical roots of Scandinavian stakeholder management, which I have carried out with a colleague, and a study that was followed by Robert Strand and Ed Freeman in 2013, they have confirmed that core elements of stakeholder thinking have been in existence in Scandinavia for a long time. But of course, in many cases, you know, people have invented things, have done things, but it's become forgotten. Now, three major aspects are central that we find in the Scandinavian historical uh, development of uh, business. 
joint interest among stakeholders, cooperative strategic thinking, and rejection of the narrow economic focus on the firm. And this goes quite far back. So it's, it's nothing that just happened in the last century, it's, it's quite some time ago. The Scandinavian business model early on rejected the notion that business can be separated from moral and ethical uh, concerns. One saw from the very beginning that the survival of any firm was common goal of all stakeholders. And there's work that was done by a researcher by the name of Renman in 1968 who has also traced these things. Therefore, sustainability based on mutual interest ever since became a concrete core focus of all. Instead of competition, cooperation is the central motivating force which enables companies to create sustainable value over time. My own study found the following points. First of all, when it comes to Norway, the Norwegian state is hugely important politically and socio-economically. In contrast to systems where the government is placed outside the CSR agenda, like for example the US or the business agenda, the Norwegian government has taken on an active role from the very beginning. And this is partially a function of how the Norwegian government is also involved in much Norwegian business through direct and indirect ownership in many of the largest corporations. And it's not just a political thing, it's a, it's a societal thing. Uh, since I'm not from Norway myself, I wasn't born there, I married a Norwegian and ended up moving to the country, I found it very fascinating to learn about these things from a historical perspective because I realized some traits that I couldn't make sense of because I thought, were these added on or is it something that there's a continuum? Now, the second point is not only has Norway been characterized by a state-friendly society, Many people think that we are paying huge amounts of taxes, which is true, but there's a very different model behind it. It also separates itself, at least from the US, by seeing business as one of many important institutions in society and not the most important, which is also interesting. The other th point we found was Norwegian business are often seen as arenas of negotiation and cooperation consensus building, participation, and where power sharing is a value in the, model, in the Norwegian model. So there is a very short distance between employees and managers. And cooperation and discussion and consensus building is still a must. The distance between managers and employees is, is really rather small, and companies view themselves embedded in their social communities and they respond to local needs without calling it philanthropy. Since business by large has been made up of small companies in Norway, they have often lacked economic power and no large scale philanthropic uh, tradition has ever been developed. However, the state has taken on the role of regulating wealth, sharing it among its citizens through taxation through measures which guarantee, for example, free education, free health care, and a generous unemployment and pension scheme. But you have to work until you're 70 before you can become a pensioner there. So for a long time, that's, that's been the rule. Much of what falls under the CSR umbrella in Norway, for example, and in other countries, falls under Norwegian legislation. So what other countries have to bring about by business doing it voluntarily, it's already legislated in Norway. And this was a big surprise for the EU uh, team that wanted to trace uh, CSR in the European countries. They included Norway, even though we are not a full member. Uh, they found that we came on top, out on top because everything was already in place through legislation. And this relates, of course, to things like workers' rights, environmental issues, working conditions, and security. Now, as a summary, let us share some thoughts about leadership, because that's the second topic. Moral leadership in business and at a business school. I would say it's correct to say that 
CSR is, uh, or developing CSR is an ongoing process requiring leadership and moral conviction. So therefore, to summarize, let me sh show you one last slide. Um, this one here. I could see being and doing inter integrated as one. And for me, ethics is the heart of leadership and is definitely essential for sustainability. Being is informed by values, emotional and reasoning capabilities, caring, visionary, proactive, innovative, and the doing part is informed by relationships with all stakeholders wanting to achieve the best for all, the common good. Leading an organization, a small or a large business, or running a business school, which I've also done, or a major international corporation, requires being and doing by the leader. And above all, cooperation with stakeholders, where ethics is an integrated part. The time of def defending a moral business, business neutral to ethical concerns, is definitely over. Business leaders who do not understand the normative core or the heart of leadership, which is being ethics, will not be able to develop sustainable business in the long run. Only with this in mind, value creating stakeholder management is possible. Thank you very much.